Hello, I'm Lance Rubin, and this is the very first episode of Really Deep Conversations with YA Authors. I am proud to say my first guest is Isabel Quintetto, author of Gabby, A Girl in Pieces, which not only has an incredible cover, but is also a very incredible book. Funny, honest, sad, inspiring. Uh, it's about Gabby, a Mexican-American teenage girl, an aspiring poet who's dealing with a lot of stuff in her life, and uh, one of my favorite first-person protagonists of all time. So I'm excited to be talking with Isabel today. I feel like I'm getting to know you in a whole new way. Really deep conversations with YA authors. I'm here with Isabel Quintetto, and uh, very, very excited to be talking with her. Uh, just quick, quick background. Isabel and I met at the San Antonio Book Festival which was my first ever book festival. That was the weekend before my book came out. So our, our friendship, the friendship we've developed since then feels like very, a very nice one also because it was like the start of my, my published book career. Yeah, that was, a, that was a fun weekend. It was a fun weekend. And, and I went to two book festivals after that and I was mm -hmm. expecting the same thing. Like, oh, I'm going to meet people and it's going to be great. And I think San Antonio specifically did something really smart where they have an event Friday night, where all the authors are, and then Saturday night, we did the uh, literary death match, but like everybody from the festival went there, and the two yeah. other festivals I've done did not have any sense of community like that, so I just kind of felt like lonely. Sometimes I feel like I am a fish out of water at these things, because there's so many people and so many authors that I don't know that right. I feel like almost at some points like disrespectful like I don't know who you are right right <laughs> you know I don't know you know that kind of situation um I was in Minneapolis this last yeah, I think it was this last week at yeah. the Allen shop and um I had a moment where I was like oh my god there's so many damn people here so many people I was like I I can't stand I can't be here right now and so we left a little early I met Meg Medina that was awesome oh, so nice. <laughs> but but what that feeling of being a fish out of water, I feel like a lot of writers must feel like that. Like, writers are not necessarily the most social creatures um, by tradition. No, that's why there's booze everywhere. So I want to move from that, the social realm of, of being a writer, to the non-social realm, the writing part. You know, I'm sitting at my computer writing. I'm like, what? what is this like for other writers? Like, are they, you know, oh, is that a Berenstain Bears mug? It is a Berenstain Bears nice. <laughs> You know, I have that feeling like, well, how, how much are writers like on Twitter and are writers just like devoting a block of time to writing or are writers like writing a couple sentences and then going on Twitter? Because some writers, it really seems like that. And I'm like, if they're yeah. able to pull that off, I'm very impressed. So I'm wondering for you, what is like a, a good writing session like? Like today, are you going to write today? And, and what will that look like? Um, today I won't be, I, hopefully I'll be writing at night. Okay. Um, cause I have a bunch of stuff to still unpack for my move. Congratulations. But, on your uh, move. I, thank you. I will be sitting in this chair. Okay. And, um, I will be doing this. Okay. Nice. For a long time. <laughs> nice. We can imagine now, we I, are I, your manuscript. It, it depends on the day. Yeah. Yeah. It depends, you know, on, on the day. So good days I can sit. I mean, I'm, I'm sure this is true with you. Good days I can sit for like eight hours and I'll just like, mm, I'm writing, I'm writing, I'm writing. That and really then, happens to me, but I like the idea of it a lot. <laughs> and then some days I'm like, I rewrote the sentence 50,000 times. Yeah. It's yeah. a good day. Like, yeah. you know. Do you ever have days where like the day ends and you just feel really bad about yourself because you didn't, you weren't as productive as you hoped? Or are you yes. behind yourself? Okay. No, yeah. Yeah, I do have days like that. Um, and, you know, these last few weeks, because I've been out traveling and I've been teaching, so I teach as well, and I've been doing all of these other things and moving and trying to unpack and doing this and doing that, I have not had, I have not made time to write. I, ha I haven't. And so I'm like, what am I doing with my life? Like, I'm just right. not doing what I need to be doing. I have, I mean, hopefully my editor at Scholastic won't see this, but sorry, Nancy, <laughs> if you do, but I have a book due to Scholastic next month. It's not even like a fourth of the way done. Okay. Like, wow. <laughs> like I, I, next few weeks, Isabel will shut herself right. in and we'll be writing a oh, shitload. Can we talk about the process of writing? 
It's going to hold us up again. Gabby, A Girl in Pieces, which is a, such a wonderful book. I, I already have oh, an, intro, an intro section I'm going to film before this where I talk about how wonderful it is, but I'll just say it again to oh. you. Um, Thank you. Will you be playing your guitar when you're doing this? Oh my I God, just, I should. I, I, That's a great I idea. Did, I, I love your trailer for Denton. I'm sorry. Your Denton. Uh, yeah, it's a trailer video. Thing, whatever. Denton. Oh my God! It was hilarious. That's really nice. When Thank I need you. to laugh, when I need to laugh, I watch it. I'm like, oh my God! <laughs> That's really nice. Well, yeah, maybe I will take out my guitar. Um, all right, great ideas. Yeah, I'm just kidding. So, so this book and, and talking to you about Gabby, you were. It sounds like you were surprised because it won the William C. Morris Award for Best Debut mm-hmm. of the Year, and um, you know has has gotten a fair amount of attention, and that surprised you. Is that true? Yes. What were you thinking yes. would happen? Um, I was thinking my friends would buy it and like my mom would buy it and yeah. um, maybe, you know, a couple acquaintances just like support and it's a very um, healthy mindset. <laughs> you know, I just, I didn't, I don't know, I didn't think it would do so well. Yeah. Um, it just seemed out of the realm of possibility for Isabel from the IE. Like it just not. You know. Yeah. Um, but I'm happy. Yeah. Well, it's awesome. And originally, I've heard you say that this book, Gabby, was going to be a, a book in verse, right? Yes. And and yes. Gabby, the character, is an aspiring poet. So in, in this version, the final version, we do mm-hmm. read some of her poems, but the whole book is not in verse. And what, what was that process like? Well, um, I tried, to, I had read Crash Room Love by our now poet laureate, Juan Felipe Herrera. And I had read um, Crank by Len Hopkins. And um, so I was like, wow, we can, you can write a book and poems, like an actual, you know, with a narrative, like a plot. And, um, and I tried to cram four years in one novel. You know, it originally was freshman through senior year, like okay. with her whole four years of high school. And it was just too much. Yeah. Um, and sent and it, the voice was different. It wasn't as funny. Um, it wasn't. Um, it was a lot more serious. Um, and I sent it out, and there was an agent who said, "Hey, if you change it from verse to prose, I want an exclusive opportunity to change. You know, to look at it." Right. And as a desperate author, I was like, "Okay, I'll do it." You yeah. know, I believe in <laughs> radical revisions. I'll do this. Yeah. And so I rewrote the whole thing and um she never got back to me and so um <laughs> she didn't get back terrible. to me until after i was nominated for the morris award oh man and then she didn't remember who i was um and so it was i thank her because she you know if it right. wasn't for her advice i i wouldn't have re you know rewritten the book Part of the um, journey. Yeah. and it is a much you know it is a much better book and it's much more um I don't know, more cohesive because it's just one year of high school as opposed to the four. Like it, it was just too much. I was trying to do too much. Yeah. That um, sounds epic. Yeah. All four years. Yeah. All four years. And yeah. it was just, and it, it was called photographs of a fat girl initially. Mm. Um, also an and so each, title. yeah. So each section was a photograph would have started with a photograph and um, Gabby would be talking about the photograph, like what happened. So these oh. photographs would have marked her. That's you a know, cool idea. Moments, yeah. Well, that's inspiring to hear. I, I'm sure for all writers out there, just to hear how drastically the book changed. You know, and I, I think mm-hmm. it was a testament to being open to altering your vision, not in a way that doesn't feel true to, mm-hmm. to what you're creating, but in a way that, you know, maybe it could make it better. Because the whole photograph thing, I, I imagine for you was. Pr- probably like a key part of the concept and then suddenly it's like oh I'm not even gonna do that anymore that's weird yeah yeah no it, it was a big part um you know I like the idea of using uh, different not only just like strict prose I yeah. like different you know things in the book so um for example that's why there's a zine in there like I wanted something that's not just prose yeah uh, because it doesn't have to be Radical revision. I think sometimes we're afraid to, to you know, just kill off piece, pieces of our books. Yeah. Um, but sometimes they need it. Do you foresee another YA book in the works? 
Or do you have one? I do. I do. So Zeke, the artist who did the cover. Amazing um, cover. Yeah. I, um, we um, are talking or will be talking about um, doing a possible graphic novel together. Yeah, uh, that's so good. So. Um, I'm already sold. <laughs> really that so, cover is so good um you know um uh, and i think i don't know if it will be especially YA, but the protagonist in the story that i sent him um they are young okay. young protagonists you know okay. they are teens and it was weird because he he said have you ever he asked me we were talking about something he said have you ever considered doing a graphic novel and I said, I was going to ask you the same thing. Like, <laughs> so would cool. you? So, who, and you I know, love work. Yeah, how do you know Zeke? Did, were you connected with him? No, Brothers? through Cinco Puntos. Through Cinco okay. Puntos. Like, nice. they picked him. He's from El Paso. Mm -hmm. um, Zeke and I, during the process of him making the cover, um, he would text me or email me and say, hey, oh. what do you think about this? This is what I'm doing. Um, cool. Do you like this? He even asked me, like, can you send me some samples of your handwriting so that, you know, oh, that's so to cool. incorporate that. So it, it Is that it your handwriting? Felt, Is this your handwriting um, in, in the cover? On the cover? No. No, okay. that's not my G. Just, but he, um, you know, but he wanted to get a sample so that he could. My, my I think my handwriting is way too sloppy. So. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, maybe loosely based on your handwriting. Yeah. No, what is my handwriting is in the zine, the last page of it, um, where there's a the lips, yeah, yeah. Around that, that is my handwriting. Hey, yeah. This, you so, guys. yeah, that, that is Isabel Quintero's actual handwriting. Cool. Yeah, that's fun. One of the last things I want to ask about is, um, you know, obviously in the past, I'd say two years, in my mind, uh, the call for diversity in children's literature and literature in general to some extent. Um, mm -hmm you know, has, has been sent out and has been resounding in a big way, especially in the social media world. There's the We Need Diverse Books movement. My mm -hmm. eyes have certainly been opened in a way that I'm ashamed to say, like, were not when I was growing up as, you know, just mm -hmm. like a, a white boy. Um, and, and it was really mind-blowing to me, this idea that, like, oh, my God, yeah, like, if you're white, you get to see yourself in all these children's books, and it's like you can very easily identify with these characters. But if you're not white, if you're any person of color, you just didn't have that. You rarely had that. So I'm wondering, was that something you consciously thought as a child? Were you thinking about your identity as aligned with these the books you were reading? Um, I think it didn't. I didn't realize what was happening until I was in college, okay. uh, yeah. and I took Chicano Lit class um, because up until that point, it just seemed the norm. Like I wasn't in a book, and it wasn't something that I really thought about. Right. It just was like the white kids get to be in books like that. So that's just what it sad. is. Like, um, yeah. and so when you, when I, when I get to college and I'm taking this Chicano literature class and I'm reading Michelle Settles' Chicana Falsa, it's kind of an awakening, like in many ways, like, oh my God, I, there are books like this with me in it. Like, you know, and then the realization, wait, I've been excluded Right. So it, it was kind of, um, I don't know. It, and it's still, you know, I, I read and I continue to read a lot of, um, you know, white literature. I'm an English, I was an English major. So Chicano lit, African-American lit, women's lit, Asian lit. Those were all kind of like elective classes, not classes that you had to take. Of but just, you know, you could take one of your choices. You could take that or you could take, you know. I don't know, science fiction. Um, right. You know. um, so, yeah, um, it was the norm. And so now, as an instructor, you know, I talk to my students about, you know, consider your education and how, consider your K through 12 education. Have you seen yourself in books? And it's a resounding no. And it's a, um, no, I haven't. You know, how many of you like to read? and not a lot of hands go up, you know? And, like, what makes you like a book? Well, if I can relate to a book, then I like a book. Okay, well, what does it mean if you don't see yourself in a book? Oh, and it just kind of hits them, like, oh, crap. Like, 
you know, it's not on accident. And so, um, you know, it's tough. It's tough, uh, I think, for marginalized folks sometimes. Because then you have, okay, yes, we do, we need, we do need diverse books. We, we do need them. Um, it's important. But the fact that they're called diverse books. Right, right. Um, sets us apart um, and makes, it still makes us other. Right. I, I think problem. the problem I have, yeah. That's the problem I have with that term diverse. Like, yeah. oh, here are some different books. Right. Different from what? You know, like. Right. It still establishes a norm. White mm-hmm. is the norm. Here's, here's what's abnormal. Yeah. Yeah. So I, you know, I have issues with that. But. Yeah. What do we do? Because my, my response, you know, I'm, just, I'm trying to read as many, you know, non-white voices as possible and really just trying to expand my own mind as much as possible. And, and what little platform I have, you know, uh, as an author now, I, I try to, you know, talk about these books and, you know, get these books out there. But like what, because clearly a, a more systemic change has to happen within the publishing industry. But I mean, how, how would you encourage you know, other than reading these voices, how would you encourage other people out there to, you know, deal with this? And, and buying those books, obviously, voting with your money. Um, yeah, I think that's the way to do it. I don't think there is one specific way to do this. I think a lot of things have to happen. Um, use them in your curriculum. You know, if you're a teacher, yeah. use them in your curriculum. Right. Um, use different authors, um, not just the traditional you know, Shakespeare is awesome. Um, you know, you know, I haven't finished Jane Eyre. Like, <laughs> like I, you know, I have two degrees in English and I, I can't get through it, you mm-hmm. know, and there are other things out there that you can use in your classrooms, you know, to get kids interested. Like look at your demographics. If you're a librarian, look at your demographics. I had this experience before I went to the Tomás Rivera Awards, um, I wanted to read, you know, they were having this huge celebration and I wanted to read all of the books before I got there by all the authors. Um, I'd read most of them, but some of them I hadn't. And so I went to the library. I was looking for Aristotle and Dante. I was looking for uh, Under the Mesquite. And I was looking for a bunch of, of books. And the library I went to was in Corona, the city I, I lived in before here. And um, where I lived, the library it was in the middle of like a Latino neighborhood. So a lot of Latinos. Um, that's, and I go in and I ask for them. They had none of them. They had none of the books. And I asked the librarian, Hey, well, what's the deal here? And she said, well, most of the librarians are Anglo. And so we, you know, we don't know where to look for those books. And I was like, you're a librarian. That is your job. Yeah. And so, yeah, that, that was my reaction. Yeah, that's insane. Um, yeah, so I think making an effort, um, talking the books up as authors, talking, you know, reading something different from your own. And I was in Colorado, um, and I was on a panel, and one of the authors was talking about how her publisher uh, discouraged her from having, um, she was a black author, from having um, black faces on the cover because... Um, those books didn't sell. So it is a true job for us to have to, you yeah. know, yeah. face those things and be, and show, especially for young author, for young teens and, and for kids to show them and, and, and say, hey, no, you exist. You know, oh, yeah. you exist, your world exists and your face exists. And, and it's so, you know, you're not different. You're not someone who's other you are part of this community. You are part of where you're at and you're important enough for me to be able to show your face on the cover of a damn book. Also, also think of us as writers um, because as much as I love being on all these panels that I've been on, most of them have been on diversity. Yeah. yeah. You know, not, I think, you know, not not creating Absolutely. like what's it like to create a character right. or what's it like to write about body right. image what's it? it's diversity yeah which is like 
it's so interesting because in trying to like address this problem, people just are falling in like a new version of the problem. And you're not the first person I've heard mention that. It's just like, well, great. Mm -hmm. I'm here at this festival on another diversity panel. And I guess the place we want to get to is where we're all just like human beings and all these stories are considered equally and you can have access to any of these stories as a kid, as an adult. Um, and yeah, and, and the white stories are not presented as the, the standard. Yeah, I, I think Brooklyn Book Festival and um, Nancy Mercado, my editor, um, over at Scholastic, she was, I think, on the planning committee for the Brooklyn Book Festival. Okay. And I was talking to her and, she, and you know, I was like, oh, I'm so happy this is not a diversity panel. And she said, none of the panels in Brooklyn Book Festival will be diversity panel because the mission of the festival was it's all diverse. Like it's already built right. into it's the so mission amazing. of the festival. Yeah. So it's not, you know, that we already did that. Like yeah. we're, we established that we have diverse authors. Right. And so now the, we're going to combine these authors and they're going to talk about writing and the book. You yeah. Know. That's great. Uh, I'm, I'm now we're at the end of the interview and, and I was thinking like, Oh, there should be a fun question I ask at the end, every episode. And I haven't thought what that might be. So, Again, you're the guinea pig. Um, let's see. Is is there anything <laughs> else you want to share that you don't get to share in interviews? Maybe that's the question. You know, something that you want to talk about your process or just, you know, vent some stuff that's video safe to vent. Uh, <laughs> not enough not enough pizza in the world and um, yep. not enough banjo music. My dream has always been to play the banjo. Now that I'm saying this out loud, <laughs> I'm regretting No, it it's a great dream. Uh, and I'm glad uh, we get to do this today. Thank you for being my yeah. first interview. I'm, yeah, thank you for having me. I and, appreciate it. And Yeah, yeah. And may we see each other at another festival soon. I feel like I'm getting to know you in a whole new way. Really deep conversations with YA.